The sounds of war. The kind of sounds likely heard at seaside defense forts such as Sumter in South Carolina, Pulaski in Georgia, and Castillo de San Marcos in Florida. Coastal forts have dotted the American seacoast all the way back to colonial times. Many played integral roles in protecting the nation from invaders. Now, many of those forts are monuments to days gone by, including Fort Jefferson at Dry Tortugas National Park. Dry Tortugas National Park exists at the mercy of the ebb and flow of the Gulf of Mexico. It's an atoll of islands at the end of the Florida archipelago about 70 miles east of Key West. As many as 11 islands, or keys as they are called in this part of the world, have breached the water's surface during the last few centuries. At last count, seven Dry Tortugas Keys are above the waterline. Hurricanes and water currents have reduced some to little more than sandbars and shoals. We don't know how many keys Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon saw when he dubbed them Tortugas back in 1513. Tortugas means turtles in Spanish. The name likely stemmed from the 170 or so sea turtles they harvested on the islands for food. The word dry was added later to warn sailors there's no fresh water on the islands. Dry Tortugas is the second oldest surviving European place name in the U.S. The oldest is Florida, also created by De Leon. There's only three ways to get to Dry Tortugas. If you want a boat, it's a 70-mile jaunt across open waters from Key West. Private boats are strictly regulated and not allowed to anchor just anywhere. A ferry runs to the park once a day, making the two-and-a-half-hour trip out in the morning. It becomes a cafe and mobile toilet during their visit. Then the ferry brings those passengers home in the afternoon. A few passengers generally stay in camp on Garden Key for a night or two. And then... Seaplanes bring visitors from Key West for a few hours to tour. Almost all of the near 68,000 acre park is underwater. Only about 1% or less than a quarter square mile of the atoll is dry land. The area is rich with life. Some of the keys have just sparse grass on them. Others host mangroves, and still others, palm trees. Of the 150 species of plants found here, more than half are non-native. Most of those were introduced by man. The shorelines are home to a variety of creatures, from tiny hermit crabs to magnificent frigate birds and their seven to eight foot wingspan. Dry Tortugas is their only nesting ground in the continental U.S. The magnificent frigate birds spend their entire life near or over water. They feed on fish and other creatures they snatch from the surface or steal from boats and other birds. Surprisingly, magnificent frigate birds never swim, but their graceful flights are a thing to behold. Scientists have watched these birds fly for months without landing, staying aloft just by riding the wind currents. Outfitted with sensors, they've clocked flights of 63 days without rest, soaring as high as two and a half miles above the Earth. They tracked one magnificent frigate bird flying for more than 34,000 miles, resting only four days during that 186-day flight. Imagine traveling more than six months far enough to encircle the planet once in a third of the way again and resting only four days doing it. While we were there, one sound was constant and almost overwhelming. Hundreds of sooty terns swooped and dived into a brushy patch of Garden Key, posted as a protected nesting site. It is easy to understand how sailors visiting the island named the birds Wide Awake. You could hear them, even on the other side of the fort, squawking and screaming in a frenzied pitch. 
Bush Key is closed each spring and summer, so the sooty terns and brown knotty terns can have space to raise their young. Both use dry tortugas as their only nesting site in the continental U.S. Almost 300 species of birds have been spotted in the park, some coming in huge numbers. As many as 100,000 sooty terns alone migrate to this tiny nesting ground out in the Gulf. And how do all of these birds live so far from a fresh water source? Many marine birds have glands and ducts connected to their bills that rid their bodies of excess salts, allowing them to drink salt water. Five species of sea turtles, the namesake of the atoll, live in the waters around Dry Tortugas. All are on the endangered or threatened species list. The park is the most active turtle nesting site in the Florida Keys. The nests on five of the islands are monitored by park biologists. Those on Hospital Key are not, because it's also home to a mask booby colony that has tried to establish a nesting ground there for decades. There were only about 20 pairs of boobies on the key in the late 90s. That keeps Hospital Key as one of four islands closed to the public. The birds are easy to see from a distance. They are just slightly smaller than Canada geese with an adult wingspan about five feet or more. The name booby comes from the Spanish word bobo, meaning daft or foolish. They are slow, clumsy birds on land. They often land on boats at sea where sailors could easily catch them and eat them. But in the air, these boobies are anything but awkward. Like all species of boobies, and there are several, they're remarkable plunge divers. They plow into the ocean at high speed, diving as deep as 100 feet to hunt. Sometimes they'll attack a school of fish as an entire colony like these boobies in the Galapagos Islands. Mask boobies generally consume their prey alone, even underwater, which can be a good thing. If confronted by something like a magnificent frigate bird with a carry-out dinner, they could easily lose it. And they have odd nesting habits. They regularly lay two eggs, but won't raise two young. The eggs are laid four to nine days apart, meaning one chick has a few days head start on the other. The adult boobies accept the firstborn and ignore the second, refusing to feed or protect it. It's generally forced from the nest by the older chick in an act of siblicide. The orphan is generally snatched up quickly by a crab or frigate bird. Those boobies are making their family homes on a key that is just over three feet above the water line in a region prone to hurricanes and tropical storms. Those birds were recently battered by Tropical Storm Elsa. And as this video is being finished, Dry Tortugas is about to be slammed by Tropical Storm Fred. As sea levels continue to rise at the rate of about one-eighth of an inch per year, all these islands barely above the water will become more vulnerable to erosion caused by storm surge. Under the water's surface, life is abundant. The coral reefs of dry tortugas harbor a rich and colorful variety of marine life such as grouper, lobsters, sponges, nurse sharks, and coral. There was a single crocodile named Cletus living in Dry Tortugas. He was first spotted in 2003 on the more isolated keys. It seemed odd because crocodiles generally live in places that have both salt and fresh water, but Cletus seemed to be surviving just fine. Then he moved over to the area around Fort Jefferson, and the public ignored signs to leave him alone. They kept feeding him, and this nine-foot-long apex predator kept getting closer and closer to visitors. So in 2017, park rangers decided the safest thing to do was to relocate him to the Everglades, where other American crocodiles flourish. Just for the record, crocodiles that are moved often reject their new digs and go back to their old homes. They doubt Cletus will chance the 120-plus mile trip through the open waters of the Florida Bay and Gulf of Mexico. But then again, it could be doable since crocs can swim as fast as 20 miles an hour. It may all depend upon if he gets homesick for his former secluded home. 
Coral can look like a colorful plant growing from roots in the seafloor, but it is actually a group of animals. Coral are colonial organisms where often tiny individual creatures called polyps live and grow connected to each other. These polyps have a sac-like body and mouth and stinging tentacles. They extract minerals from the seawater to build a hard skeleton to protect the colony. The park is home to about 30 species of coral. Park biologists track the health and size of the coral colonies as environmental conditions change. If one becomes sick, they'll treat it with things like antibiotic paste to nurse them back to health. The coral reefs occupy only a small fraction of the park. Still, they serve as a habitat for approximately 25% of all marine fish species in dry tortugas. Nurse sharks are common around these areas. While some consider them the couch potato of the shark world because of their laid-back characters, nurse sharks are formidable predators. They feed on fish and invertebrates they often catch at night by sucking them out of crevices. They'll brush the bottom of the waters where they live and then lunge headfirst into the bottom chasing their prey such as crabs, shrimp, lobsters, or small conch they'll break open with powerful jaws. Some nurse sharks are born in the park and never leave. Others will venture off hundreds of miles and return to the islands to mate. Biologists have tagged many of the sharks to track their behavior. Humans in the park routinely swim near nurse sharks every day without incident, but they are not beyond biting a swimmer if provoked. Their mouth may be small, but the teeth are razor sharp. And those aren't the only sharks in the waters. A great white was spotted by researchers just off Dry Tortugas in 2019. The sharks will eat conchs. It's hard to say much about life in South Florida without mentioning conchs, including the connection between Dry Tortugas and Key West. Let me explain. Conchs are large saltwater snails with striking shells that live in oceans in many parts of the world. Throughout the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, queen conchs are likely the best known of the species. They're commonly found in seagrass beds. They help keep the grass healthy, eating the algae and dead plant matter. They are also an important food source for other sea creatures. Conch is also the name adopted by residents of the Florida Keys, especially Key West, as a nod to the Bahamian settlers that came to the islands. The Conch Republic was a name the region adopted in the 1980s by residents fed up with Border Patrol roadblocks choking traffic on the only road connecting the Keys to mainland Florida. The agents were hunting drug runners using the roadway to hustle drugs into the U.S. The name stuck with the natives called saltwater conchs and newcomers that have been around for seven years, freshwater conchs. It was the Conch Republic that challenged the federal government shutdown of Dry Tortugas National Park in the mid-90s, demanding it be reopened. A flotilla of civilian and fire department boats called the Conch Navy traveled to the park declaring a full-scale invasion by the Conch Republic. They challenged federal officials who tried to get into the park the local residents raised money to keep the park running since the closure impacted the tourist-dependent economy of the Florida Keys, but no government agency would take it. The most overwhelming thing about Dry Tortugas is the immense Fort Jefferson. It covers about 16 acres, which is almost all of Garden Key. That's more than half the footprint of the Pentagon. But Fort Jefferson has been a point of contention almost from the start. It was basically a white elephant of the coastal defense system that Congress imagined after the British attack on Washington that burned the White House, the Capitol, and all but one of the city's major public buildings in 1814. In early 1825, Commodore David Porter inspected Dry Tortugas as a possible site for a fort. He decided because it is so small 
has no fresh water source and is so far from land it was not a practical place to build a fort. And what would it protect? The best guns of the time had an effective range of less than three miles. It was almost 40 miles to the nearest islands and about 150 miles to the mainland. That left lots of open water for aggressors to avoid the fort's guns. And they could cut off any of the fort's resupply ships. So instead, they built a lighthouse on Dry Tortugas to help ships avoid the treacherous shallow waters. The first documented shipwreck in that region was a Spanish galleon in 1622. Discovery of that ship in the early 1970s brought about what became known as the Atoka Motherload, a treasure estimated at $450 million worth of Spanish gold, silver, and other treasures found in the wreck. In the mid-1700s, the British ship HMS Tiger wrecked there, and the crew was stranded on Garden Key for 56 days. They survived. The Norwegian ship Windjammer went down in Dry Tortugas in 1907 and went undiscovered for almost 70 years. It's now a popular scuba diving site for park visitors. Five years after that initial survey, another survey was made of Dry Tortugas, and the lieutenant leading the expedition gushed about it being a perfect place to build a defensive fort. It took another 16 years and more surveys, but construction began in 1846 based on designs by Joseph Totten, an engineer known for grand plans and an opulent lifestyle. He liked big things. He participated in an 1821 report to Congress on the principles of coastal defense construction. By the time they began building Fort Jefferson, more than 100 coastal forts dotted the North American seacoast, from Maine to Oregon. The Statue of Liberty is mounted on the remnants of one of those installations, a granite fort named Fort Wood, built in the early 1800s. It protected New York from the British invasion during the War of 1812. Totten imagined Fort Jefferson as massive, the largest brick masonry structure in the Western Hemisphere. The $3.5 million structure was intended to house enough artillery, men, and supplies to withstand a year-long naval siege. By the way, $3.5 million in 1847 today would be worth more than $12.3 billion. That was about 4% of the U.S. military budget for that year. The fort was to be built around the existing Garden Key Lighthouse and its keeper's cottage. The lighthouse continued to operate during construction, but it was not very effective. That's why another lighthouse, about twice as tall, was built on nearby Loggerhead Key in 1858. More than 150 years later, it still works after being fully automated by the Coast Guard in the 1980s. Until the Civil War, construction on Fort Jefferson was mainly done by contracted labor. About 20% were slaves from Key West, and much of the rest, Irish immigrants who were indentured servants. They all worked under the direction of the Army Corps of Engineer officers. When President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, only 22 slaves remained at the fort. Lincoln had declared it a prison, and the fort population was growing. To provide fresh water, Totten designed the fort to hold 1.5 million gallons of rainwater collected on the fort's ramparts. It was then funneled into more than 100 cisterns built into the walls. The first problem was Dry Tortugas has an annual rainfall of just 40 inches a year. That's less than Birmingham, Boston, or Baltimore. And most of the rain falls during tropical storms and hurricanes. Since the rain they did collect sifted through the salty, mineral-rich sand piling up on the roof, little of the water was clean enough to be used as drinking water. So, new rainwater collection cisterns were built on the fort's parade ground. 
Steam condensers were also brought in to distill 7,000 gallons of seawater into drinking water each day. The fort contains enough bricks that if placed end to end, starting at the fort, they would make a tiny paved road all the way to New York City and then continue westward to beyond Chicago. More than 16 million bricks were purchased from the Pensacola firm Rayford and Abercrombie. Engineers discovered the Florida bricks withstood the harsh Gulf weather better than those from New York companies. Ironically, records indicate company owner Anderson Abercrombie was a prominent Alabama politician in Russell County, whose family was very active during the Civil War. But by 1862, Union forces had proved the fort they were building in Dry Tortugas was already outdated. Fort Jefferson had never been attacked. But a similar brick installation in Georgia had been. The bombardment of Fort Pulaski showed the brick forts that Totten liked were very vulnerable to the new rifled cannons. The only recorded threat Fort Jefferson ever faced happened in January 1861. As the story goes, 62 Union soldiers from an artillery unit under the command of Major Lewis Arnold arrived at the fort. A day later, a Confederate schooner from Florida showed up and demanded the fort be surrendered. The Major warned the boat that they had a choice, leave immediately or be destroyed. The schooner left, unaware that they had just been bamboozled. Not a single cannon had been mounted in the entire fort, and there wouldn't be for another week. At the peak armament, only about half of the envisioned 420 cannons were installed. The exact number is in dispute, but many of those that were put in place were mounted long after the Civil War ended. By then, the fort was becoming little more than an isolated pile of bricks. In fact, none of the cannons at the fort were ever fired in battle. Of course, getting those 13-ton Parrot guns and 25-ton Rodman cannons into place on the parapet and in the casements had to be quite a feat. The big Rodman fired a solid 450-pound shell or a hollow 350-pound shell that would travel as far as the Loggerhead Lighthouse. It took a dozen people to load and fire them. As mentioned earlier, Lincoln declared Fort Jefferson to be used as a prison where convicts would be sent instead of executing them. It remained in Union hands throughout the war, mostly as a prison camp for captured Union deserters. Fort Jefferson housed over 2,500 prisoners. By the end of the war, there were less than 600 soldiers to guard them. The prisoners were forced to continue building the fort. Two years after the Civil War ended, funding for all masonry forts was cut off by Congress. But now being used as a prison, Fort Jefferson was still open for business. Changing the fort's mission kept it viable as construction continued at a snail's pace for another eight years. Some parts of the design were abandoned, like the five arched powder magazines in the fort's parade area. Only two were ever started, a large one and a small one. Like so many things at the fort, neither were finished. Meantime, an insipid, powerful force was destroying the fort structure. It was emerging from a design feature meant to protect it. The iron plates called Totten shutters installed on some of the cannon ports were supposed to protect artillerymen from return fire. The doors would open as the cannon fired, and they would automatically shut during reloads. The problem? Seawater and iron don't play well together. Iron expands as seawater makes it corrode. Gaping holes today show where those original Totten shutters, named for the fort's designer, were installed. Restoration crews have installed some mock replacements, made of other material, that better withstands the corrosive water of the Gulf of Mexico. Sand piling up on the fort's ramparts absorbs rain and seawater that splashes onto the fort during frequent storms. The water soaks through the masonry structure below, and stalactites and stalagmites are forming from the decaying stonework. 
While reading the list of prisoners held at the fort, one name likely stands out, Dr. Samuel Mudd. He's the Maryland doctor who was one of eight people convicted of conspiring with John Wilkes Booth to murder President Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson, and the Secretary of State William Seward one April night. Johnson's attacker lost his nerve. Secretary Seward was stabbed in his bed but survived the attack. And of course Lincoln was killed by Booth. Investigations revealed Booth and Mudd met several times before the attacks. Booth even spent the night at Mudd's home near Waldorf, Maryland. He also stockpiled provisions there to use during his escape. The doctor treated Booth's broken leg the Friday night of the murder. Mudd allowed him and another conspirator to hide in his home until sometime Saturday and contacted a carpenter to make a set of crutches for Booth. It was not until Sunday that Mudd had a cousin contact the troops looking for Booth to tell them they had been at Mudd's house. Booth was killed when they caught up with him. The eight surviving conspirators were found guilty. Four were hanged. Mudd, along with Michael O'Loughlin, Edmund Spangler, and Samuel Arnold were sentenced to life in prison at Dry Tortugas in 1865. Two months after he arrived, Mudd tried to escape on a transport boat leaving Fort Jefferson. He was caught and put in an empty ground-level gunroom that soldiers called the Dungeon along with other Lincoln assassination conspirators. They were let out of the cell 12 hours a day wearing leg irons to work. Mudd wrote his wife, complaining about his punishment, and she wrote to President Johnson, who ordered the shackles removed. Two years later, Yellow fever ravaged the fort. At least 275 people became seriously infected. 38 died, including O'Loughlin, the prison doctor, and four hospital nurses. Mudd became the prison doctor and was credited with saving lives. Two years later, and just four years into his life sentence, President Johnson pardoned Mudd, along with Arnold and Spangler. Mudd returned to Maryland and resumed his medical practice. He even became a Democratic candidate for the Maryland House of Delegates in 1877. Arnold returned to Fort Jefferson several years later to photograph his old prison. Some have tried to excuse the doctor's actions and even paint him as a victim of circumstance. To others, his name is still Mudd. Construction all but halted on the fort when yellow fever struck. Little work ever really resumed afterward. The seawall was finished in 1872. The Navy left just a caretaker force soon afterward. Dry Tortugas became a coaling station to refuel Navy steamships. That was when the brick lighthouse inside the fort was torn down. It was replaced with an iron-sided harbor light erected on a corner of the fort. The harbor light may have been snake bit from the start. An iron door of the lighthouse blocked the lantern from being seen from the east, so they removed the plate. Then the lamp itself began giving operators problems, and shipwrecks continued. That iron construction, like with the Totten shutters, didn't mix well with the seawater. Over time, the iron corroded, especially around its base. So the harbor light today has been disassembled. The pieces were hauled off to a company in South Alabama to be refurbished as part of a $4.5 million restoration project. Someday the fort will get its harbor light back to sit atop the crumbling walls. All the while, the more powerful loggerhead key light continues to do the heavy lifting of guiding ships. After the Army and Navy gave up on Fort Jefferson as a defensive fort or prison, the Marine Hospital Service used it as a quarantine station for a dozen years in the late 1800s. The Navy coaling station continued to provide fuel for ships. A 60,000 gallon per day distilling plant was also constructed to provide fresh water for the ship's massive boilers. Then hurricanes destroyed all that in 1906. After that, 
vandals and storms turned Fort Jefferson into little more than a disintegrating carcass of a fort. Many of the cannons were sold at auction in 1900 for about $14,000. That sale included about 90 cannons, more than 19,000 cannonballs, shells, and carriages. Ten really big cannons were left at the fort, Rodman's and Parrot Guns. They were likely so big, they were more trouble than they were worth to sell and move. But they sold the mounts from underneath those heavy guns. The Park Service says the artillery pieces were left laying in the dirt, rusting on top of the fort for more than a century. Dry Tortugas became a bird reservation and was all but abandoned. During World War I, a wireless station and naval seaplane facility was set up there. Soon afterward, the Iron Harbor light was deactivated and just kept rusting. President Franklin Roosevelt declared Fort Jefferson a national monument in 1935. Almost 60 years later, in 1992, Dry Tortugas and the fort were made a national park. But little money was available to repair and maintain the park, so the fort just kept falling apart. Eventually, in the 1980s, airmen from the Civil Engineer Unit at South Florida's Homestead Air Force Base devised a way to mount the rusting cannons onto re-engineered carriages on top of the fort. Contractors cleaned off the rusting giants and gave them a fresh coat of paint. When Congress passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009, an effort to help Americans most affected by the recession and invest in infrastructure, education, health, and renewable energy, money for Fort Jefferson was buried in that plan. More than $13 million was included in that stimulus package to repair the failing walls of the unfinished Fort Jefferson. It's still not done. The 2021 park operating budget request was just over $2 million, less than either of the two previous years. Slowly over the decades, the unfinished fort has fallen victim to nature and neglect. Despite conservation efforts, the brick walls continue to fall apart. We saw the once manicured parade ground overgrown with tall grass, bushes, and unwieldy trees. But the natural beauty that is Dry Tortugas National Park is bountiful. Man couldn't make the place worth visiting, but nature did it with ease. <laughs>